So my name is Yanni um, or Jonathan, whichever, whichever feels more natural. Um, and uh, I've been using R for a while. Um, and in the past, I used Travis and Affair for continuous integration. And in the past year, I think uh, a lot of a lot of the community has moved to GitHub Actions. Um, has anyone here tried GitHub Actions before? Yeah, I've tried it. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to run through, um, try to run through the basics and build up to a workflow that actually maintains um, the behind the scenes actions to make the Slack packages that we use to maintain the the R4DS um, dashboard. Um, there's a, a few packages and they're all interconnected on GitHub Actions. So there'll be a chance to see how do you connect repos and, and make them interact with each other. So, so GitHub Actions is just, in general, it's a CICD. I understand that last week you guys talked about CICDs and continuous integration. Yep. Okay. So it's the same idea as Travis, Apoya, Crone, stuff like that. Um, the main the main addition in GitHub Actions is that you can actually trigger workflows based on different different things that people do in GitHub. So it's not only commit, but it's also if someone opens an issue or a pull request, or if you want an update a readme based on some different action, then this, this um, type of workflow will do that for you, which is a step up from working on Travis, for example, that you couldn't really do that. Obviously at any time, if anyone asks questions, feel free to ask questions and stop me and we can go on tangents, it's fine. Um, so in the, file directory, the place that you would put your workflows that are, again, very similar to Travis, that you have a YAML and it interacts with the virtual computer on GitHub. So you open a subdirectory called .github workflows and you put all of your workflows inside this specific subdirectory. And GitHub will pick it up on its end. The way to do that, um, either you do it manually, which is an option, or you can use use this and they have use GitHub Actions and it sets up for you a basic uh, uh, workflow that I'll go through in the next few slides, um, RCMD check. So you can start checking your packages right off the bat. So the basic structure of a YAML for GitHub's actions is that you, you define what action do you want it to be triggered on. So it can either be a single action or, or a group of actions. So either on a, any push, any commit that, you, that the repository has, it triggers a workflow. Or you can have it multiple things like a pu push or a pull request. And you can also name the branches that you want that action to be associated with. So you can tell it on um, push and pull requests for main and master, run my workflow. And it can be more intricate and we'll get the different types of things that you can do with it. Next thing is just a name, which is used as a label for the UI and the IDE. Um, so in this case, it's RCMD check. And the last part, the main part, is the job. So here, under the area jobs, I'm naming my the job that I want to use. I tell it what machine I want it to run on. That can be Mac OS, it can be WinOS, it can be Linux. They have a number of different machines that you can run on. Um, as an aside, if you are going to run it on the GitHub Enterprise. Fun fact, Mac OS is 20 times as expensive as a Linux. 
which I found out not too long ago when IT pinged me and said, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> so if you are in GitHub Enterprise, be sure to run on Linux. Um, and then once you define what machine you want to run on, there's the steps, which is basically the things that you're going to be running. So when you use the element uses, it goes to another resource, another GitHub repo, and it pulls in a batch of steps that someone pre-wrote. So in this case, there's something that GitHub itself has actions and they have a checkout routine that they have that is used a lot. Uh, R Studio has their own actions and how to set up R so you don't have to write it yourself. Um, Jim Hester maintained, originally wrote it. I don't know who maintains it now. Um, and then after that, for the UI, you add a name. And then you, the description that you want to call it, the next step that you have, and then what you want to run. So in this case, it's really simple to have R commands because you use at the bottom, you add shell R script zero, and then it just runs the code that's within the between the run and the shell. And it's very straightforward. It's much easier than R script and adding quotes to everything, which you do use at some point, but for the basic things, you just put R script and it, it runs fine. And the last step here, after I install the dependencies, you can run an RCMD check. So again, run, you run the shell R script, RCMD check, and it runs the check on your package. If you put it all together, then it just, it's a flow of the pieces that I described before. This is, this is a full YAML for running RCMD check. Pretty straightforward. Any questions at this point? Yeah. So this file lives where? Like, if you were going to use use this, for instance, here. Right okay. Here. Um. And then it's just like a matter of using the GitHub GUI to hook them up. So once you commit, it it. GitHub looks for that for that folder and YAMLs inside that folder. Once it sees it, it's going to trigger the actions. So I'll I'll skip to a place that has actions. Magic. So let's say here, for this, the slides here are connected to a to a um, the actions themselves to deploy the slides to an HTML. So. Um, so they're in GitHub workflows, have a YAML here. Once it sees it here, when you can go into actions and here you can see that I, I deployed a lot. And it every time it pushes, it's going to trigger a new job. And you can have as many as you want. Um, in a second, I'll show you how to um, write multiple workflows inside the same YAML. Similar to Travis, you can have a matrix of jobs. So you can deploy to different machines at the same time or different versions of R, stuff like that. So you can have that within the same YAML. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, thanks. Um, my other question was gonna be, so I'm new to all of this stuff. Um, sure. So it's pretty logical to me what you are testing in that file. You're just making sure you're checking your package, like doing what we do locally prior to, to allowing the PR. Is there any other like fancy fun things we should consider? That can yeah, so uh, yeah, the rest of the slides. <laughs> that's, that's nearly all of the other slides, <laughs> things that we can do. Um, but before we get to the really fun things, the basic uh, pieces that are going to be built really fast up afterwards. So um, to build 
concurrent jobs, um, the, excuse me, workflows uh, simultaneously, you can use a matrix, which under jobs, you define a strategy. Um, fail fast just tells it if one of the, if one of the uh, workflows, one of the jobs in the workflow fails, if fail fast equals true, all of the other ones are gonna fail right away, kind of a, to save time. Um, because the way the R packages are really checked, you a lot of times you wanna set it to false because you want each system to, to do their own thing. Um, so here, basically it's a matrix that you can call in different pieces. So you're parameterizing the workflow. So here, the same runs on that was Mac OS before. Now it's gonna run four times. This workflow is gonna run four times, each time with a different value for the config, matrix.config.os. So matrix.config.os. So it's gonna do Windows, the latest build, the latest um, uh, container, excuse me. The latest container, the Mac OS, and the same container for Ubuntu, but different releases of R. So all of all four of these are going to be triggered at the same time, which has good and bad things. I'll I'll go through the why I I don't like this specifically. Um, I, there there are use cases where you know that all of them are supposed to work as well as each other. Um, and you, you have stable uh, workflows, but when you are developing and testing, you kind of want to be able to control which container is running at any given moment based on a commit. And in order to control that, I'll show you how to um, interact with the message that the commit has in it. So you can, similar to skip Travis. Uh, so when you push uh, into Travis, you can do skip CI or skip Travis and it'll just skip the build for you. Um, in GitHub, they don't have that. So there's ways around it. But if, but if you have a matrix, you're gonna basically gonna fork all of them at the same time, which is not what you want. Um, so here the name is also parameterized. So it's the OS parentheses and the R about. Environment variables, another important thing. Um, there are a lot of baked in uh, environment variables that you can use. There's a full list here. So you can use all of these, which is very useful, like the, the name of the repository, the type of event. So all of these things can be worked into your workflow. Uh, so you can interact with it. Um, the only caveat is that GitHub underscore is is uh, is saved. So all of us that use GitHub underscore PAT, we, there's a diff we have to find a different solution. <laughs> so things like uh, working with remotes, you have to find a way around it. User defined. Um, here, there's a picture here. I'll just show you here. So in settings. You go down to something called secrets. Within secrets, there is a new repository secret. You just add a new one and you're on your way. So here, to get around the GitHub underscore PAT that I need for remotes, I define GH underscore PAT and then I'll show you how to make it that R understands it. That's actually GitHub underscore PAT. So how, how do you use those, um, those environment variables? So here, this is for, this is the Slack, when, when the Slack, all, all the Slack packages need a token that we, that we use uh, to interact with the API. So here I'm using secrets dot in the environment, the variable that I have. And then 
I use this within the, the env um, field for the job. And then R, once R boots up, it's going to have that environment variable available to it to use also. So here I'm, re I'm getting around the GitHub underscore as being preserved, as being set, set aside by GitHub Actions. So secrets.gh underscore PAT is being set as an environment variable for our GitHub underscore PAT. That's a way to get around that little annoying thing. Any questions? Okay, the skip Travis or skip app fair, things like that. So here I have a job that I can tell it, you can use if clauses nearly everywhere in the YAML, but here I'm, I'm putting it up top where the initial jobs are being defined. And I can use this um, variable that's available from GitHub GitHub dot event dot. It's written here, the message of the commit. So here I'm asking, does it contain skip when OS? So if it does, I'm basically going to write my commit message and then I'm going to add skip when OS and it's not going to run this specific workflow. That's a way to kind of control which one is running. So if you have like a Linux, a WinOS, and a Mac, and an OS X, and you only want to test on the OS X, you can just add skip on OS, skip Linux, and you're ready to go. Um, a lot of common workflows um, are in the, um, a repository that Jim Hester and our studio maintain. Um, you can, I'll go through one of them. So there's CRAN submissions, uh, unit test coverage, rendering a readme, deploying a package down, and a lot of things that our users use a lot. So they already figured out how to do it and they pre-wrote it. And you can just grab a snippet and put it in your YAML and you're ready to go. So for example, CRAN submission. Um, so this is set up pretty much like I went through the first example. So this is going to run on a push and a pull request on the main or master. Name of it is RCMD check, and they use a matrix. So they're defining all of these workflows to run at the same time. The RSPM is the package manager um, URL. I haven't seen this before. I saw it a few days ago for the first time. So I guess it's just a new environment variable that they created for the package manager. Um, basically, it's a place like a CRAN URL. Um, and then here they're using checkout, uh, the action setup for R, and it's telling it which this, this script is expecting a variable or is, can can have a variable input to it, and it's telling it which R version to set up the R with. So you can control which R version you want to use. There's a script to set up Pandoc. And then here, this is a bit, this is where they're reading the description file and using here they're using the remotes to understand which which uh, dependencies to install. So they're querying the dependencies here. They're saving that information here so they can query it later. And then they're caching our packages. For some dumb reason, it still doesn't work for Windows. Sorry, Windows fans. Um, there's a lot of issues opened and threads about that, but I already forgot why why it's not possible, but I guess it's, it just hasn't been 
figure it out yet. Um, and then here it's using uh, a GitHub. The actions is from GitHub. So there's script called cache in, in actions and it's expecting these three parameters. So these are all, this is from the environment variable, our libs. This is something that's available always in a GitHub action. So you can quick, you can use the operating system that it's running on. And then this is just a way to, to cache files. Um, and then at the end, it, checks if it needs to save it again based on the restore key, which I'll get to in a second why that is good and bad. Um, here, we're installing system dependencies for mainly for Linux. So this is just a way for them to, to get the proper Linux dependencies installed. Um, and then here, installing dependencies, running the check, and then uploading the check results if it's a failure. So here you can ask, you can ask, you can create a logical for GitHub actions in the workflow. If it fails, do something, which is also very useful. Any questions? Nope, okay. Um, actually, I do have a question. How do you how do you know which of these versions to use? Like, I think you showed a version two somewhere above. Oh, this is yeah. I I just look at what what is the current. Um, they our lib maintains this pretty well. This page because it's what they use. So I usually check here once in a while just to see that things haven't changed. And usually if it if it's if it changes the version, it you'll 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 see that things aren't working pretty fast in your workflows. Like there's there's a bug in there and it's not coming from your package. You'll 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 see it pretty fast. Um, but yeah the the main place is to look I I would I would bookmark this page and, and come back to it. Okay. Um, so now we got to the fun part, the tricky tasks. Um, so installing magic. Um, on Linux, it's pretty straightforward. The only caveat is that you need to add this weird pseudo call in order for magic to install properly. And if you are on um, Mac, you need to make sure that you're installing ports before you install magic. That's the main, the main trick there. Tiny text, tiny text is also fun. Um, lots of hours spent figuring this one out. Um, so in Linux, it's just the regular app, app get calls that you would use. Um, the, the trickier part here is actually in Windows where, yeah, there's a, uh, here, let me go here. So tiny text windows. Okay, so here there's a weird thing that you have to do. You have to add it to the path for tiny text to actually for the tech to to be seen by the container, and it's not obvious how to do that. <laughs> so this is uh, just a uh, a place to keep in mind that there's just, if you ever run into the problem, try to remember that there's, you have to add it to your path. Um, 
to, to have the containers here. You can also interact with the GitHub API. So this is from uh, uh, a repo that Mal uh, Salman uh, uses. So here she she up she updates a commit status if the if the environment is not a fork, and then she runs a curl call, and you can use all of the pieces that are in the GitHub action itself in order to construct a, a full uh, API call. So you can interact with things like uh, um, GitHub or Netlify or things like that in order to, to post things. Another thing is committing back into your, back into the branch that you that you pushed from, that you triggered the workflow from. So here, this is for using cover page. So cover page is a package basically that creates a readme file that is meant to make unit testing more readable. And that readme file lives inside, I'll find one, inside a, uh, So this file. So this file is being created by the GitHub Actions CI and deployed back into the repository. So you can interact with the repository that you're pushing into, which is also pretty cool. So here, in order for Git to work, prop, in order to push back into Git, you have to set the user email and username, and then it's just regular calls. Here, there's an example of using R script, like a regular R script call. So just it's just like command line. It's just like terminal. Um, just here, in order to combine the calls using a slash. Here, I'm using also um, pieces of the secret, the GitHub token that I have. Um, the GitHub actor is my username. The repository that it's being pushed to, and the ref and the asset and the commit hash. Any questions? These slides are also online, so you'll have a chance if you ever want to, to slowly look at the code, um, you can. And also all of these YAML pieces, they're in, as you saw before, they're in the snippets folder here. So all of them are self-contained examples. Did, uh, did you, you need the uh, email package to create that table? Is that why? It's needed. Yeah, I need it. Yeah, so there's so yeah. Um, if I can spell my own name. So here, there's. When the package, when a unit test fails, there's different icons that pop up, um, and that uses emo. Okay, the weak points in GitHub Actions that have been seen so far. Um, some are my weak points. Some of the stuff that other people saw. Um, you you can only invoke a workflow from when you commit. So you can't, in the UI, you can't trigger a workflow or you can't rerun a workflow, which is a pain. Um, so you have to kind of muck up your commit 
uh, commit logs. Um, cron jobs only work uh, on a main branch. So, or the branch that is defined as the main branch um, for the for the repository. So you can't run like delayed jobs on on uh, development branches or anything. And then here, this has to do with the cache. So the way that the restore keys are set up, um, they have this version here, and that's on purpose because you can't blow away caches in GitHub Actions. They just don't let you do that. Um, so the only way to get around that, let's say you're installing, you have a bad installation of a package or um, you updated the container, but the packages are not being updated, uh, haven't been updated yet. That happens a lot of times in magic installations. Um, so the only way to get around it is to bump the version here. And then that key won't sync up with what the system is seeing at the beginning of the workflow. So it won't totally reinstall everything again. That's the only way to make GitHub Actions think that you blew away your cache. Um, OK, now to, to make this even more confusing and more fun, um, there is the GitHub Marketplace, where it's kind of a CRAN, but less, less strict about what people put in there. Um, so you can use a lot of different scripts that people have created to, to people uh, thought of different things in order to make life easier for themselves and then published it basically to this particular place. Um, there's a lot of junk in there, but there's a, with the junk, there's a lot of good things too. So it's kind of touch and go, but there are a few, I highlighted a few here, but um, it's worthwhile if you're, if you're stuck on trying to do something, it's worthwhile to look at this marketplace and see the solutions people have come up with. Even if you don't use them, you can look inside their code and figure out, okay, this is the type of thing that they did and you can try and rec recreate it yourself or use what they did. Um, so here are a few of them. So there's um, something called Teammate where you can SSH into the container, actually, which is kind of cool. So if something isn't working and you don't want to recommit all the time, you can SSH into the workflow container and just run terminal from it and, and figure things out from there. Um, people have been known um, to, there. there's a caveat with it that that kind of means that you have a free machine to work with that has a single core in it. So people sometimes use that if they're kind of stuck without a machine that they need. Um, repository dispatch, I'll show you in a few slides what this, the use of repository dispatch, basically it means that you can trigger on any event Really, it's a kind of a free-for-all event. So you can define your own event that you want a workflow to be triggered on. Um, and then GitHub push action, um, push to another branch in a repository. It's kind of an annoying pain. So let's say I'm on main and I want to, like here, I, I had a main branch and, a, and, a, and another branch and a pages branch. Even myself, I mean, when I was getting this ready, I had a lot of annoying pain trying to deploy it to another branch. For some reason, it just didn't want to do it. Um, so a way to, to get it to someone else wrote script and you can use it um, for push actions into another branch. Um, so debugging, debugging with teammate. So again, this is a script and it, and all you have to do is put this in your workflow and it'll stop at this point. And what it does, it gives you the SSH into 
the right address and you can go into the machine. Um, deploying into another branch. So here, once you did some kind of work and you can commit it to the branch that it's working on, and then once you do that, you can use this, this uh, marketplace action in order to deploy it into a different branch. It makes it really easy to do. And last is repository dispatch. So what this does, you set up on your parent workflow, and I'll show you here, it's pretty easy. So here, this is running on for the Mac uh, workflow. So it has a lot of the same ideas that we've been through. So installing dependencies, check, it's running cover, running cover page, pushing it back, deploying the package for package down. So here's an example of that. It's pretty straightforward. And then here, I can use this repository dispatch. And what it does, it takes the token, my GitHub token, the repository that I want to trigger somewhere else, and the event type that I want it to be called. And here I called it push. And then I give it what is called the client payload. So here I can add more information in order to pass into another repository. So when this whole workflow ends successfully, it's going to trigger another repository. And that, repos that repository is going to wait for this, for this event to happen. So when I'm passing to the Slack threads repository is the name of the repository that is the parent repository that's triggering it, the reference, and the SHA. So I have all information in order to do something on Slack threads. So you can do that for an, any number of repositories that you want. Any questions about that? So if I go into Slack threads, I'll show you on the other side what it does. Is that run sequentially? Yeah. Uh, well, it it triggers, so those add, uh, it, it doesn't wait for the, so let's say add Slack threads and another one, Slack blocks, I think. So they run concurrently with the with the trigger. It, it, it doesn't wait for Slack threads to finish in order to start the Slack blocks piece. That's your question. Yeah, so well, what if you needed it to finish? before like what if you didn't need it so yeah so i can so i can add to slack threads another dispatch into a dependency it has an upstream dependency so i can i can sequence it correctly through the repositories so here you can see it has a repository dispatch here let me show you the action for it. <clears throat> so this is waiting for, so on the repository dispatch for a push type that I defined another file for a push call. It's running the same idea and our, it's checking the package for but now I pass in all that information about reference in order to use it here. So it's, it's kind of pointless to run the, CM, the check for this package if I'm not telling it which commit hash to use for that dependency that's triggering it. So here, when I do the install GitHub, remotes install GitHub, I'm using that GitHub event client payload. So I can tell it, use a repository, add a certain SHA. So now I'm 
actually running an RCMD check based on that other uh, commit that I have in another repo. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, this this makes sense. It's just like this is a lot. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how much time you have to spend to like understand all this. Uh, it's a piecemeal. So I mean, it's a uh, it's it kind of it it's a it's a way kind of to expand beyond um, what we are used to Travis and Affair, where because you're in the GitHub um, uh, network. All, all of these things are in the GitHub network. So you can have them talk to each other now, which is kind of the idea of the architecture is to, to let you uh, create networks of packages. So you can kind of see where this is going that you can kind of create your own little CRAN network of, C of CRAN checks basically within your own network of repositories. Okay, so now we triggered we triggered a, a a we triggered from one repository to another repository. Now, what happens if that fails? That child repository needs to go back upstream and tell the parent you you broke me and create an issue or something to to let the person knows, so let's say someone is, someone created a pull request to you, okay? And that pull request triggered a workflow. That workflow was successful for your, for that immediate repository, okay? Now, let's say you have a verse of packages and you need to make sure that that PR didn't by accident screw up packages downstream in addition to not screwing up your package on the PR. So now this is a way in order to create that network of checks. So what this is doing, this is clapping back. This is saying, if, if you fail, if, that, if the downstream check fails, use curl in order to open up an issue and say the reverse dependency at this repository has been broken due to this, this commit. So now we closed, we were able to close a network of, of repositories inside their own self-contained little, little uh, universe. And then, does that make sense? I know this is a lot. <laughs> so th this is actually the what what is behind all of the Slack verse packages. This is this is exactly what what we're using in order to maintain all those packages because they are very interconnected. So in the end, what you get is this. So anything that is being pushed into Slack calls is triggering downstream workflows. And then if any of those fail, they ping back to the offending repository commit. So these packages are all interconnected to each other. And then on each on each of their pages, those badges are all here for each of those packages. So there's a there's some kind of warning signal to say, okay, this this branch of of these set of packages aren't working correctly. 
So is there a, a Slack post? Or yeah. Or is that just an, uh, an official one? That's what we're using. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, okay. Any questions? Um, actually, the, uh, on something earlier, but so you mentioned like earlier that uh, you have just like an, there's a command which is R script and then like a, you know braces where you list the commands that uh, it'll run you know above the R script command. Mm -hmm. But then there are other places like here like you just pass a side where it says R script and then you got the E flag. So you're not using that same syntax. Yeah, because sometimes here I I could have used it, but um, well not really because. There are, there are this this could be split up into different chunks, I guess, because here I'm running git git commands and R commands at the same time, so I can't put it in the braces of the R script for R for everything. So I have to mix and match. There are places here where, you know, let me find one. So here, um, mm -mm -mm. maybe let me find a good example. So there are times where you need to use um, the built-in uh, uh, se uh, secrets or some kind of environment variable that is built into the, the system. So you need to use these curly brackets inside of your R script and you can't really, you have to, you have to write it more verbosely. Can't use the R script uh, uh, braces there. Mm, let me find a good one. So yeah, I mean it's it's a choice. You can you can do one liners. You can you can do this. It's Depends on the situation that you're using it, basically. And then, um, the last piece is just for the, the question. RSPM is faster. I just saw that. Okay. Um, so this thing, last thing that I'll touch on, just so you know that it's there. Um, in my previous place that I worked, we wanted to be able to try and and create more of an arm distance from CRAN and the CRAN checks, because once something breaks there, you're it's kind of too late. You have to play catch up basically and fix your packages. So we wanted to create more of an arm's length uh, check checking system um, for our packages. So the way that what we did, we used GitHub Actions and something called Shield. And what Shield does, it basically looks at your description files and figures out by itself all of the GitHub remote um, locations that each of the dependencies has. And then you use that in, in a workflow in order to install all the all the master branches instead of the CRAN. And then you're kind of more checking your package on development level. So if something is breaking on the development level, you have more time in order to first know about it and second of all, try and fix it before it gets to CRAN. So it kind of creates more of an arm length, arm length and it, it's kind of the way NPM does it too. So 
give, given a description file, it's going to figure out what is the current SHA of each of each dependency in the file, in the description file. And then on GHA, in GitHub Actions, you can use that output in order to install the remotes. And that way you're checking your file against the, not CRAN, but GitHub. So you're creating more space between you and a commit to, to CRAN. We can use that in order to create this type of output. So here, for the parent repository, it has these dependencies. And right now, HCR on the master node, on the master branch is failing, and also NIDR is failing. So that can be something that you can that information you can use in order to check is is my package going to be affected by these failures or not? So that's that's like um, testing on our develop, but on all the packages as well, essentially. It's not on our develop. It's uh, it's not the version of R. It's the version of the packages. Right, but like the package develop. Yeah, it's, it's, develop. it's like it's like running the test on our develop. But for package develops and yep. knowing like what would break before it breaks kind of thing. Yep, exactly. You should, uh, you should submit this to the Heart Studio table contest. <sighs> all, the, all the work is goes into it, you know, but not as much the interface, but it actually still looks pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so any, any questions? Um, again, there's in here, there's all of the little snippets of, of code, they're in here. So feel free to, to nose around here and, and take whatever, whatever pieces help you out. Okay. Cool. This is such an awesome resource. Thank you so much. Yeah, we know. It, it was a lot of information. I, I think uh, it, this is something I feel like I would definitely learn better by doing, but like at least I know I would definitely use this repo to come back and like yeah, figure out which, which of these like templates I can use. That's what I was thinking too. Maybe in a future meeting, like using John's the little uh, Reprex package he's building and adding this to that. Because, um, yeah, this is just like such a wealth of information you just dropped on us. <laughs> yeah. it, it's all really organized well. Uh, so, yeah, no, I think I'd be able to figure out what I want to do just from some mm -hmm. of these examples. Yeah, and is there a a Slack channel for the for GitHub or stuff like that, GitHub actions that that we have in in our 4DS, something like that. I think I don't there's think one so. a GitHub channel. There's a book club. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I mean you can you can feel free to open issues here if you, if you need help or ping me on our 4DS yeah. or here there's um, they in our studio they have a good um, good resource. This is awesome. This this is the main resource that everyone uses. So use this. <laughs> um, I think at the end they have uh, not here. They have place where to find help. So. This is also a great resource. Um, so there's a lot of people that have have had a lot of trouble at the beginning of GitHub Action. So a lot of people know all the little nooks and crannies of it right now, but I don't think it's it's as well documented as Travis or Fair. So um, you just have to uh, ask a lot of questions. 
and, uh, and people will be happy to help you. Okay, cool. great. Uh, I don't know who wraps it up if John's not here. But, uh, yeah, uh, do, do we know who's talking next week? Uh, no, we can take volunteers. Um, next week, sorry, one second. Uh, I think John and I were talking about like having like a breather week, but in terms of like bring your own package and we can like answer questions or critique it or, you know, help you through parts of it kind of thing, like a package workshop day. Um, the next part of the book is metadata and licensing. So metadata meaning uh, description package. Uh, let's see here. What does metadata mean again? Uh, yeah, so it means the, like the package's description file um, and the license file that goes with it. So we can talk about licenses and so on that. So it's a pretty easy chapter. But I think John and I were talking about, and people have asked about, like, um, you know, bring packages that you're working on, and you can take over the Zoom screen and you know show us, you know, things you're having problems with, um, in terms of like our testing, or um, we could do a live, like we could that's that's today we could work through GitHub Actions together, um, or something like that, as well. So kind of a workshop day as opposed to like a book day. Uh, but if not, the next book chapter is pretty easy as well. So uh, that's fine. Yeah, that other, other sounds good to me. Uh, maybe I'll finally um, do my Tony style package. I need to do yes. It. <laughs> you might need to recruit a few uh, regex helper people. Yeah. I don't know if I'm, I'm not confident in mine yet. Is, uh, is Tyler on? Uh, maybe he's good at it. Tyler's on, I think. I can see him. All right. Well, yeah, other, other one I think sounds good. OK, well, thanks for inviting me to talk. And, uh, Thank you. That was awesome. So much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Okay.